I was a gay activist. So, and I was also a lesbian and a professor. And the reason that I was a gay activist was not because I was angry or upset or um, uh, you know, had an ax to grind, but I genuinely believed that the world would be a better place um, with a, a politics of inclusion and acceptance. And, uh, and I felt that sexual diversity was a key part of, of what, what real diversity meant. And, um, you know, I, I, never, I never remember struggling with same-sex attraction. In fact, when, when sometimes, uh, you know, well-meaning Christians say, you know, we want to put a banner out in front of our church and say, you know, please welcome everybody struggling with same-sex attraction, and, you know, and we're hoping we'll capture people like you used to be, I, I'm sort of scratching my, my head. You know, I was a very happy lesbian. I was not struggling with same-sex attraction until I had committed my life to Christ, and then I struggled. <laughs> but prior to that, there was no struggle. Um, I genuinely believed that uh, lesbian sexuality was a, a more moral choice. Uh, I had had a heterosexual past, so I considered myself an informed lesbian, if you will. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, well, wasn't raised in the evangelical church, so I'm not quite... <laughs> I'll probably say other things in the, in the next 10 minutes that might, uh, might cause a flurry. And, you know, and I just, I just really did, did not un, un, understand it. And I remember once uh, speaking at a gay pride march and there was someone who had a, a placard up that said, AIDS is God's curse on homosexuals. And one of my friends quickly made a placard that said, if AIDS is God's curse upon homosexuals, then lesbians must be God's chosen people. And, and I think, you know, I, I say that, I'm not just to be a smart aleck, but I think people don't realize that when you choose to not share the gospel, but instead choose a kind of easy Christian moralism, it is so easy to defeat. Mm. You know, it, it, it both angers and goads and confuses, but it, it also just, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how did you come to Christ? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had written an article um, that was published in the Syracuse Post Gazette, and it was on the Promise Keepers. And I don't remember what the Promise Keepers did. I, maybe my favorite parking spot was missing that week, but they came to town, and I was very much on a war against patriarchy, and so I wrote this letter. And, um, and I had just recently co-authored the university's first domestic partnership policy. So, um, you know, so I think I was kind of in the news. And an elder at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church brought my, my, um, my op-ed uh, and put it on Pastor Ken Smith's desk and said, look, we need to shut this woman up. She's trouble. And Ken apparently said, oh, how about if Floyd and I invite her over for dinner? <laughs> um, and I was at the time writing a book on the religious right from a lesbian feminist point of view. And so when, when Ken wrote me a letter and when we subsequently talked on the phone, um, I quite frankly thought, yeah, I'd love to go to dinner at your house. This is like a free research assistant <laughs> for my book because I was a real scholar and I realized that, uh, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't wade through this book without help. And so that really began a very fruitful um, uh, conversation that, that turned into a real friendship. So at my first dinner at Ken's house, he omitted two very important steps in the rule book of how Christians deal with a heathen like me. You know, take notes, right? Number one, he uh, did not share the gospel with me. And number two, he did not invite me to church, which made me wonder if I was chopped liver or something. You know, it was a, but one of the things that really did show to me was that uh, Ken was willing to have a kind of long-term friendship with me. He didn't, you know, he wasn't thinking to himself, oh no, you know, what if she gets hit by a car when she leaves this house and I haven't shared the gospel with her? It will be all my fault. You know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was in it for the long haul. And one of the things that he did not do, and if you talk to Ken Smith um, or, uh, you know, read some of the things that, that, that he has written, I mean, he, he will tell you that he, he did not talk to me for a very long time about my sins, plural. And he didn't talk to me about my sins, plural, because he knew I had no understanding of sin, principial. And, you know, and, and what I mean by that is I had no idea 
that Christians believed that original sin distorted everyone. And Ken wasn't going to deal with my sins, plural, until he felt that we had a, a, a deep enough understanding of these things. Hmm. And so we spent a good bit, bit of time talking through the Bible, talking through life. Um, he, he not only witnessed to me the gospel, but he also witnessed to me what it means to be a good neighbor. And um, I think when someone asked Ken recently, you know, you know, when did you talk to Rosaria about you know, the big issues there? You know, Ken never presumed that my being a lesbian was my biggest sin. Um, hmm. He, he knew it wasn't, in fact. He knew that unbelief was. Hmm. And, and so, I, you know, his house was a really interesting house to me. Um, the, the gay and lesbian community is a community quite given to hospitality. And I tell people that I use the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my queer community because that's where I learned that. But I noticed Ken's house was a lot like my house. People would come in and out, and the Bibles would be open. And you know, this wasn't like a museum piece. You know, it'd be open. Somebody would spill coffee. That's okay. Um, but I was especially struck with Jesus's invitation that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. My yoke was hard and harsh, and it was just increasingly so. And at a at a dinner party that that was a kind of a standard thing um, in the gay and lesbian community, it's common that one night of the week somebody's house is always open, so that the community really functions like a community. People know where to gather and talk and things. My night was Thursday night. And at this gathering, my, my transgendered friend cornered me and said, you know, you're changing and this Bible reading is changing you. Hmm. And, and, um, and I, said, I said, you know, what if, what if I said, I think we're all in trouble? You know, what if, what if, I, what if I said I'm, I'm starting to believe that Jesus is real and risen and we're all in trouble. And in 1999, when I did come to Christ, I did not come to Christ because, because I thought it was a good deal. Hmm. Okay, I didn't come to Christ because I thought that, you know, like weighing a car insurance policy, I was hedging my bets. And I didn't come to Christ because I had stopped loving my girlfriend or stopped loving being a lesbian. I came to Christ because of who Christ is. Hmm. And, and I came to Christ because I was, I was convicted that although I had felt sincerely that I was on the side of peace and justice and compassion, that it was indeed Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time.